welcome once again to Cinemaholics, where we review the biggest and best films coming to theaters and streaming online. One of us is, is a film critic, one is a casual moviegoer, and the third person is me, your host, John Negroni from the internet, California. On the show today, he is our film critic from the internet, Pennsylvania. He's also a pop culture writer for Cinema Blend. He's everybody's film best friend, I would say. It's Will Ashton. Hey there. Uh, unfortunately, our casual moviegoer and sound producer, Maverick Hines, uh, isn't on the show this week. It's just Will and myself, uh, because we have kind of a, a catch-up episode plan. So we'll get to that in a second. But first, you can find more episodes of Cinemaholics on adamtickets.com. Go to the movie news portion of the site. You'll find Adam Insider. Uh, it's an awesome new website up and running for Adam Tickets. You should also download the Adam Tickets app because it's awesome. And you can email us, Cinemaholics, anytime you want. Cinemaholics podcast at gmail.com if you'd like to support us. And uh, just, you know, we, we've got mouse to feed over here in the, the internet California slash Pennsylvania. So if you want to support us, uh, just go to the show notes for this episode. You're going to find links to all kinds of good stuff, including our Patreon page. You get exclusive perks. I like just helping us decide which films to review. And wow, that would have been useful for us this week, Will Ashton, because we decided, well, we didn't, we weren't sure what movies you and I were both going to be able to see this week. I guess that's fair to say, right? Yeah, it was tough because um, a lot of movies did not come to my fair city this year week yeah yeah it was a kind of a weird weird part of the month where it's oscar season we talked about a little bit last week lots of films are coming out it's kind of like machine gun fire uh screeners are just getting shot all over the land at the moment and it's it's tough because we don't really know ahead of time what we're going to be able to see so we decided to do kind of a catch-up episode because there's so many films that we've wanted to talk about for a while that we just haven't found a place for, especially because last week we did our winter movie preview, which you can check out right now if you haven't already. Um, and that's all to say Oscar season is very exhausting. But uh, Will, Will Ashton, I mean, you know, we're not doing Oscars talk yet, but uh, how, how are you feeling about this 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 time? Are you feeling like you're catching a lot? I'm trying to. It's tough, like you said. It's just there's so much going on that you want to see as much as you can, but you can't see everything because it's just too much. But I'm getting the, I'm going through. I'm trying to get my top uh, 10 list for the year in order kind of getting closer to what I think is pretty, pretty solid roundup, but yeah, it, it's tough. Yeah. I'm right there with you. Uh, I have to turn in my top list by the end of this week. And, and it's, it's annoying because every time I think that I've seen everything that I need to see, I, I see somebody else's top list. And like, I mean, I didn't even see, you know, destroyer for example is one mm-hmm. I haven't seen yet. Cold war, uh, if Bale Street could talk. And in fact, I don't think either of us is going to be able to see that for a while. So we're going to have to do our top 10 lists for certain publications before we see one of the most anticipated indie films of the year. So that's, uh, that's a recipe for disaster. But, uh, you know, on that note, uh, it, it's it's something we're complaining about, I guess, a little bit. But, I, you know, I don't want to speak for you, Will Ashton, but I love this time of year. And I love that we have the opportunity to do this and talk about so many different films and uh, that we have uh, really a privilege uh, to talk about films. So uh, something that I did recently that you find listeners can check out is I did a 2018 in film tribute video. I edited together uh, basically not every movie of the year, but it's like 162 films um, from the last 12 months starting in January of this year. I mean, there there is some... Uh, I made a couple of exceptions for films that maybe technically came out at festivals in 2017, but they didn't get their U.S. release until 2018. So that's like where I drew the line. Uh, but that said, uh, it's like an, it's eight and a half minutes. It's 162 films that I edited together in a single video. That's kind of just uh, a celebration of all the hard work filmmakers did this year. There are films in this tribute, and I know you know this, Will Ashton, that I didn't even particularly like. But it, it's sort of my philosophy of even some of the worst movies of the year had moments in them that I thought were uh, either brilliant or memorable or you know iconic in their own ways. So uh, definitely uh, check that video out. And uh, Will, thank you for uh, you gave me some key tips on this video before uh, I hit publish so thank you for that oh yeah sure thing john um yeah and then on, on that note uh, i guess we can just dive into w- what this episode's going to be so as you probably noticed from the episode title we don't have a featured review but i don't think it would be super fair to say that it's like a mini review episode it really is just sort of a, a marathon of reviews uh we're going to try to get to a lot of films this week that uh really run the gamut of genre, tone, and filmmaking. But uh, I definitely think that like everything's, hopefully the idea is that we're everything's going to get like a fair shake. 
Uh, some of these films you and I have actually seen. We're going to start with something that you and I have both seen, sure. uh, which is funny because it could have been the featured review, but then we just decided, yeah, let's just do all mini reviews so we can catch up. But uh, yeah. we're going to be talking about Mowgli. Uh, that is the new uh, Andy Serkis directed film. We're going to be talking about Roma, Creed II, The Favorite, uh, Shrek Retold, which I'm very excited to hear you talk about, Will. Uh, Vox Lux, The Shivering Truth Season 1, Anna in the Apocalypse. Uh, a few others, and I'm, I'm, I don't want to say them by name on the off chance that we pass out in this episode from exhaustion <laughs> and do fewer right. than we, we said we were going to do. But those, those are the heavy hitters we're going to start with. Uh, we're going to try to start with films that are a little bit more recent. These are some things that you can, you know, that just came out or they're just now in theaters and you can go check them out. Um, including Creed 2, of course, which we've, you know, we've delayed our review of, unfortunately, but we're, we're going to talk about it in just a moment. First, let's talk about Mowgli. Okay. Um, so Mowgli, Mowgli, it's technically called Mowgli Legend of the Jungle. It is a fantasy adventure film directed by Andy Serkis, a screenplay by Callie Clovis. And uh, as you can imagine from the name of this, no, it is not the uh, the Mowgli's, the band. Uh, they did not finally get their movie. Uh, this, mm-hmm. this film is, of course, based on all the Mowgli stories uh, by Rudyard Kipling. This is another, yet another adaptation. This is the second live adaptation in recent years. Uh, from, of course, you remember in 2016, we had The Jungle Book, uh, which was Disney's live action remake of the animated adaptation of the original stories. Uh, so that film came out, I want to say 1967, the original animated film. And so this new one, however, is very much its own thing. It is very much based uh, a little bit closer, some would say, to some of the darker tones that you would have found in Kipling's older stories, uh, you know, much more of the, uh, the political drama behind the rules, the laws of the jungle, as it were. Anyway, the film stars uh, Rohan Shun. I think he plays the uh, the young boy in this, uh, who plays Mowgli, of course. Matthew Reese, Frida Pinto. These are the live action actors. But then, of course, we have voice and motion capture performances that uh, really have some some heavy hitters in them. If you were looking at the 2016 Jungle Book voice cast and thinking to yourself, how are they going to top that? Well, they definitely went for it with this. Uh, we have Christian Bale who voices. Bagheera, you have Kate Blanchett, you have Benedict Cumberbatch, and Naomi Harris, and Andy Serkis himself. Now, this film, I, I think it's safe to say, has been something that Warner Brothers has been wanting to put out for quite a while. And this isn't a story owned by Disney. Uh, it is yep. in the public domain. Uh, so Warner Brothers, since 2012, has been wanting to attach a director to this. Uh, in fact, I, I didn't know this until recently, but Alejandro uh, Inaritu actually was going to do this version of the film, which is funny because I did think of The Revenant several times <laughs> over the course of Mowgli, Legend of the Jungle, believe it or not. Yeah, um, Ron Howard was also, I believe. Ron Howard, yes, absolutely, as well as Steve Clovis. Those were the the three main directors that yeah. Warner Brothers was pitching to before Circus uh, was attached. Um, not long before the second Rise of the Planet of the Apes film came out, uh, which it made a lot of sense to bring Andy Circus on to direct this one. Uh, you know, Andy Serkis is someone who's been wanting to direct a huge blockbuster like this based on many interviews, and he is what I would call a motion capture savant. Um, he's kind of a powerhouse in that industry, and it makes a lot of sense for something like The Jungle Book story, yeah. Uh, yeah. which obviously needs a lot of motion capture. Mm-hmm. Didn't you do some AD work for um, The Hobbit films as well? Oh, of course. Yeah, he's. Been, I think he did work for that as well in uh, the Lord of the Rings films, the original trilogy. Um, so I, I, he's definitely been a more of a presence than some people would assume. Is like, oh yes, the man who played Gollum. Well, you know, that that really isn't the full extent of his talent, obviously. So that's he a- sleeps uh, in that motion capture suit at this point, <laughs> like with the balls and everything. It's like his PJs. Yes, it's gotten that comfortable for him. Believe it yeah. or not. Um, it, now, the weird drama behind this film is that it was actually shot in 2015. It was actually shot a lo- over a year before the 2016 Disney Jungle Book live action film came out, made a ton of money and left Warner Brothers in a very precarious situation because I think they were hoping that that movie was going to do terribly or really just not do all that great. Uh, that obviously wasn't the case. And so rather than release this film in 2016 or 2017 even, uh, this was pushed to a December release in 2018, three years after post-production began, and uh, now released through Netflix as a Netflix film. Um, mm-hmm. So 
definitely you get the sense that this is a bit of an afterthought, but Will Ashton, walk us through the plot this time around. How is it different from the story that I think a lot of our listeners already know and maybe love? Um, yeah, so we just... I think the original title at one point was, Mo, or um, what was it, Jungle Book Origins? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. it's Rise of the much, Mowgli, oh, Dawn man. of the Jungle. So they never had a good title for this thing, I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's it's about basically how he uh, becomes like a man, essentially. The same story, in a sense, as the other films, except this one focuses more on like kind of like the trials that he has to go through. It's a little more contained. It's not really him like going out and exploring as much as he is just kind of like his relationship with the pack, the wolf pack that is um, Shere Khan's in this, but like the um, prominent ape characters. And in this one, um, uh, I'm trying to think what else is in this one that was in the other ones. But yeah, it feels more about like the character of Mowgli than uh, like kind of precariously going through his eyes into the jungle and. It's weird because I didn't really feel like I got to know Mowgli that well in this movie. I, I thought that was one thing that was really going to stand out. It was like Mowgli was going to become more fleshed out as a character, but I didn't really get that sense here. And I think you're going to disagree with me on that. I am going to disagree with you, but uh, I'll let you finish your thought. I mean, that's basically it. I don't, <laughs> I don't have, have anything much to add beyond Interesting. my thoughts on the film. Yeah, well, we, we this is a film you and I disagree on. Or we already kind of knew that going in. This is one that I, I actually genuinely like this film uh, quite a bit. Uh, I think that it's a very solid effort and I think it's an, it's, it's just in a very unfortunate set of circumstances, the way it was released. But, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I think I really disagree with you on, on Mowgli. It, it, for once I actually saw what I considered a, a kind of a range of emotion that, uh, was a, definitely subtle. Was oh, definitely yeah, emotions. Something. I didn't question that. I'm, I'm talking about the character, which is, which for me told me more about the character than I think any sort of you know, backstory of like, well, what were his parents like or any sort of thing like that? I thought the way that he interacted with the jungle, you know, creatures in this one, and notably the, uh, the other wolf cubs was revealed to me, at least uh, a lot about his character that I thought was actually pretty interesting and something that made me appreciate this one on a different level than I think. Cause uh, you know, I love the 2016 version. I think that it's a, it's a wonderful film. It's really fun. It's, it's, uh, obviously very impressively made and, uh, but you know, it, it really is sort of a disposable film because it doesn't really, you know, it, it really is just sort of like a reanimated film compared to this. And and I think that some people are going to question the animation in this film. I know that there's been a lot of cr- criticism with how it looks uh, with uh, certain characters, the, the facial, um, the mocap features, as it were. I would say that the 2016 Jungle Book in my opinion, was superior in some ways with the look and feel of the world in that one. But there was something about Mowgli that I appreciated just in a different way. And, uh, but I, well, I wonder if you disagree with that or if there was something off putting to you about the effects in this. Somewhat. Yeah. I mean, there are a couple of shots where I'm like, Oh, well, wow, that's really impressive. I mean, I, was this Weta? Were they involved with the special effects for this film? I believe so. They, they usually run with circus. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I I didn't really find it fun. You, you described it as fun. I found it kind of tedious. Like, it, it felt very oddly paced. Talking about paced. the 2016 version or the... Well, I mean, I, I guess I don't really have strong feelings for either film, but I, I think I respect the 2016 version more now, considering that I think this film... Uh, well, I, I'll give Andy Serkis this. I think he is a very competent filmmaker. I think it's bold of him to do this as... I don't know if it's technically his directorial debut. Like, it's kind of weird. Like, it's the second film that he's directed that's come out, but he was working on this film before Breathe, which is the film he directed last year. Mm-hmm. So it's it's kind of his directorial debut. And that's why I said, like, a big blockbuster kind of film. Right. And I think, I mean, there are certainly scenes towards the beginning and the end I think are well-directed and show that Andy Circus probably has a future as a visual storyteller. But I just don't think the film really comes together in a way that intrigued me or really made me see why he wanted to do this telling of the young book and to be fair i mean i I tried to look at this film on its own merits i tried not to um compare too much to the 2016 film that you're talking about but i find that it's almost impossible because like i mean yeah yeah like the cg is okay but especially coming after the 2016 film it looks much worse and i just I, I find myself really just like 
not bored, but not really engaged with what he was trying to do here. Though I do think he was inspired as far as what he wanted to do. Interesting. Uh, yeah, it's just a, a matter of disagreement here because th- there was something about the way that this film staged its story that it actually did engage with me a little bit more than the Disney version. I think to me, the Disney version was such a roller coaster. You know, Mowgli has to survive. He has to get away from Shere Khan. It's very simple and it works for that movie. I think, I think it had to be simple. Uh, what I appreciate about this one is that it's, it is a little bit more complicated and in ways that I think to what you were saying, you think so? I do actually. I I think that the compare, I think it is actually useful to compare these two films because it is in the comparisons where I found things to be impressed by in Mowgli that in some cases I didn't know exactly where the story was going. Um, there, there's a lot of scenes in here where you have characters just sort of talking to each other and sort of debating the laws of the jungle, explaining the laws of the jungle to Mowgli. And you do get the sense from my perspective that these characters have motivations that were more interesting to me in a way than the Disney Jungle Book one. I mean, in the Disney Jungle Book one, it very much is like, we like Mowgli because we like Mowgli, or I hate Mowgli because I hate men and I hate fire. And it works for that movie, I suppose. But in here, I I understood every character a little bit better. I thought uh, Ka, for example, actually had a role this time around. Uh, You know, Bagheera was more complicated and wasn't just an archetypal, you know, one note, one dimensional character here who is just sort of like, I've got to look out for Mowgli at all costs. There were actually debates between characters about, is this really the best thing that this character should be doing? You know, we we didn't walk through this part of the story much, but, you know, really Mowgli's, you know, crisis in this film is the fact that nobody seems to want to accept him. Uh, even the people who love him worry and they debate the ethics of him living in this society. And I think that's where I engaged with it was that I wanted to know more about the jungle law. And I, I actually did find it find it interesting. And I thought that the world that they made here was dramatic and it at times it was gorgeous. At times it, you know, I can agree with you that It wasn't all that impressive sometimes, the way some characters were a bit stiff and cold, and it just didn't feel like the budget was really thrown into the post-production in a lot of this. But no, for me, I was actually with it the whole way, and I I actually kind of hold it at about the same level, more or less, as that 2016 Jungle Book. And if I had anybody recommend or ask for a recommendation on either film, you know, I think both are worth checking out. And I especially think that if somebody who isn't really into the Disney, you know, vibe, and if they're not that into like the animated film in particular, I would say this. I wouldn't be surprised if somebody would prefer this one over that film uh, or even the animated one as well. I think that I think there's a lot to like here. And I'm a little disappointed that uh, that this is sort of a a minority opinion. I think a lot of people are dismissing Mowgli Legend of the Jungle. And I can see some of the reasons why. But for me, I think overall, it actually works about as well as uh, definitely more than I was expected going in. I know this is one that you had a little bit more hope for. I wasn't really rooting for this one. I kind of, uh, for years, I haven't really been on its side until now. I wasn't really excited to see a new Jungle Book film per se. I just was excited for Andy Serkis's filmmaking career. And I do think he has potential and I would like to see more films he directs. But I just think this movie, I, I will say it is more totally consistent than the 2016 film. I remember one of my biggest complaints with that film was that it, it felt like it had a kind of an identity crisis where it was like trying to be similar to this kind, kind of a darker, uh, more mature film than the anime of one. But Disney's influence kept being like, you can put the, the song in there, right? It's like, <laughs> well, I don't think it's going to fit, but uh, okay. Um, yep. Yep. This one, I mean, I, I will say, I mean, it, totally it's a little more, the same, but I guess at the same time, I was kind of hoping there would be like a song or something to kind of shake the monotony of it because it just was so like oppressively dark for most of it in a way that I found like not really engaging but more just kind of tedious. That I just was kind of missing the, the fun, lightheartedness. I mean, there's like one scene like involving a chase that's like kind of lighthearted, but like, beyond that, it, it does kind of just feel, in my opinion, a bit like a slog. and. I am glad you like the film, and I wish I did too. But there is stuff in here to like. I mean, I did. I think Andy Serkis is uh, what's his what's the character's name? Baloo. Baloo. Yeah. Yeah. I thought his take. Uh, it it gave me a chance to see a Cockney accent bear, which is not something I expected to see today. But <laughs> you know, it was fun. And I mean, there are a couple. I mean, I do actually think um, the kid who plays Mowgli is actually better 
than the kid that played Mowgli in the uh, 2016 film. Although I think to your credit, I think it's that's more that his character actually like felt like he had like more agency, I guess, in the story. Whereas in that movie, it's like more reaction. Mm-hmm. I felt like. So. Sure, and then and they do a little bit more production design around him. Uh, he he is a bit rougher. He kind of is a bit mm-hmm. more feral in certain scenes. I think I probably would have agreed with you that this is tedious if the halfway point there's something that happens halfway in where Mowgli is in a completely different environment we won't give away kind of what happens but I think that's what prevented the monotony for me at least where I was like oh this is different this is Mowgli experiencing new circumstances and there were scenes in there that I thought were pretty uplifting it comes back down to dark again and I think in a way that is one of those moments that will kind of haunt me for a little while there's this I will say there's a dark uh, moment in here for sure I will say I did actually enjoy the the village scenes, the stuff with the humans. Mm-hmm. It's more I think my I actually had more of an issue with the motion capture animal stuff, weirdly enough. Which is uh, I don't know. Usually when you want to see the humans more than the animals in your Jungle Book movie, that seems like a, a problem. <laughs> uh, I I think both were great, and I uh, yeah I, I recommend this one. I, I give it a B. I think it's pretty solid. And uh, what was your final grade? I gave it a C plus. Okay, so not a, not super far away from each other, but uh, the difference, I guess, is in the recommendation. So, all right, uh, that's Mowgli, Legend of the Jungle. Uh, next, we have Roma. Uh, this is another Netflix film. Uh, this past week, I sat down to do my top 10 Netflix movies of 2018. And uh, that list is going to be coming out probably by the time a lot of people are listening to this. And uh, at the very top of the list, spoiler alert, I suppose, Roma is the best one. It, it's the best Netflix film. Uh, it's also, I think, the best Netflix film made in any year. Uh, it's not exactly the highest bar. It's competing with films like Mudbound and Beast of No Nation and that like, which great films, but definitely not films that have. I don't think a lot of people had on their top 10 li- lists for the past couple of years. But as we kind of enter award season, I know you would agree with this, Will. Roma is one of those films that is very much talked about. Uh, it seems like a shoe in a front runner, uh, for Best Picture. Uh, I think it's going to be one of those rare foreign language films that's going to uh, get a nomination for Best Picture. And at the moment, I, I see it winning the whole thing. Um, so the film itself, uh, as I mentioned, is foreign language. It takes place in Mexico. And it was written and directed by Alfonso Cuaron, a wonderful director. Yeah, great uh, Alfonso Cuaron. Yes, I, I consider him just the the best working director when it comes to uh, one takes and really editing in general. I think that he's one of the best uh, around. Um, I think that he he is a, he's just a wonderful filmmaker who constantly pushes the envelope. I think Children of Men, uh, his film from two thousand six, I want to say, is one of one of the best films of the twenty first century. And his new film is one that it's uh, probably more personal than some of his more recent efforts. I think the last film a lot of people saw from him was Gravity. Uh, that was the Sandra Bullock film with George Clooney. It takes place in space. And that one was kind of like a, a razzle-dazzle space kind of action. Not even action, but survival kind of thriller. It was a beautiful film. I really enjoyed Gravity. But Roma is definitely something a bit more restrained. It takes place in the 1970s. Uh, it is the story about a up, I want to say upper middle class family. You know, they they aren't quite rich, but they are. You know, they do well enough. the uh, The patriarch of the family is a doctor in the city. Uh, this is Mexico City, and they make enough that they have you know a nice a nice house. Uh, you know, they have a couple of live in housekeepers, and uh, this is in the Colonia Roma district of Mexico City. Uh, as per the name of this one. Uh, The story follows this family as they begin to fall apart uh, due to a series of circumstances. And we see all of this happen through the perspective of their housekeeper, played by Elisa Aparicio. And she is based on a real character. And you'll start to notice as the film progresses, you're watching her do uh, mundane things, cleaning floors, you know, cooking and getting things for people and really sort of functioning in this family unit. 
And there is an obvious and clear distinction between her social economic status and the status of this family. And we start to follow her story. We learn a little bit more about her. We learn, you know, some of her childhood. We learn some of her friends, uh, this man that she is going with. And then eventually she becomes pregnant um, while all of this is happening. From there, you have a series of events that are really captured, as I was saying before, like memories. Um, Alfonso Cuaron uh, based this movie on actual events that happened to him and the people he knows. The story is based on a real woman, um, not named Cleo, like in this film. uh, I forget the name of the person it is based on. Uh, However, he actually asked her permission to make this film. And this is one of those films that is... It's one of those films where it does seem like a lot is happening as you're watching the daily lives of these characters, mainly Cleo. Cleo is obviously the star here, and her performance is what this movie is. And the best things about the film are what I think I, I think what's going to continue to make this film at the top of people's discussions is one of the best of the year. And that really is the directing and the writing. Now, the directing here is about as experimental as you can get with a film without alienating your audience to a fault. Uh, There are certain camera tricks in here, things like where the camera will be an observer in one moment, the way that a lot of cameras are, to sort of being a rotating, like like a living room fan almost, rotating back and forth and up and down as you're watching a character move about. And this is one of those wonderful films where camera work does tell a lot of the story. And thank goodness it does, because a lot of the story is sort of brilliantly realized photographs moving. And for some people, that's all they want. Um, and, it, and for me, that, that can be the case as well. I think that just watching you know, art on screen is what this movie can really be uh, for much of the runtime. There, there are certain things about it that rubbed me the wrong way that I wouldn't really be able to get into without going into spoilers, but there is something kind of interesting when you consider the the artist himself, Afonso Cuaron, who says himself that he sort of sees himself through one of the young children in this family unit, this family that loves Cleo. And this is his story of what he thinks his housekeeper was going through in his memories. And and there's sort of a at times, there can be sort of a disconnection uh, from my reading of the film between how he views her and how she views herself that I think will challenge some people to walk away from this film feeling like it is as satisfying as the artistry they just saw really made it out to be. And so that's that's what, for me, can hold it back from being on the lines of some sort of masterpiece. I really don't know if I can say it's a masterpiece on the whole. It is a masterpiece in terms of directing. I think anybody who watches this film, especially if they're fortunate enough to catch it on a big screen, they're going to walk away from this with you know picking their jaws up, wondering why more directors don't experiment with cameras so successfully the way that Alfonso Cuaron seems to do in his sleep. Um, and, and I want to credit, of course, uh, more than Quran himself, but he also was the director of photography here, which I didn't mention. He did the cinematography, he did the editing. So this is sort of his own personal, you know, if an EGOT could be in like one movie, this gets uh, about three-fourths of the way there. So that said, uh, it, it's very much his movie. I love personal visions uh, and how they can be expressed on screen. There are some nits that I do have with how he chose to tell a personal story about him and a very influential person in his life and how I think that that might have made her feel as a real person. It really isn't within um, a lot of the viewing experience's control. I, I think it's something that kind of goes and extends beyond you know, the rules that this film sets for itself. So uh, it, it's hard for me to walk away from this one writing it off. Absolutely. I don't think you you could and still consider yourself someone who loves film because this is a film for film lovers. Uh, but at the same time, and I, I really don't think it's, it's one that's going to click with me in the same way it has with a lot of other people, but I really appreciate it for what it is. I can't wait for you to see it, Will Ashton, because uh, I want to hear all about your thoughts on it, and especially because it is a film that, uh, like last year's Coco, it's told, not of course Coco wasn't in Spanish the entire time, but it is a film that does celebrate Mexican culture in very authentic ways, and uh, I I really love that we're starting to get more stories uh, on this level 
you know, out of that culture, especially in a time where we don't have to get into it. But, you know, obviously, uh, at the moment, you know, relations between America and Mexico are quite fraught right now. Um, and so with all of that in mind, I, I definitely uh, would love to watch this movie again. I can't wait for it to release on Netflix again, because uh, I want to see it uh, on in my living room as well and uh, see if see if maybe I like it uh, a little bit better the second time, which would mean that I would really love it. So uh, that's Roma. And uh, are, when are you going to be able to check this one out, Walashin? Uh, hopefully next week. Um, I was trying to figure out when it is playing here. It was initially set to come this weekend. But the theater distributor said there was a scheduling mishap, so they're trying again next week. Mm. So I guess not going with fingers crossed that it's coming here then. If not, when does it come on Netflix? Uh, I believe next week, I want to say. I think it was, okay. I want to say it's like December, between December 14th and the 21st. I, I apologize. It's been in limited release since November 21st. Um, but oh, actually, I do have it right here. It's going to start streaming uh, this Friday. So pretty soon. Um, that's yeah, December fourteenth. So, so there you go. Uh, yeah, one way or the other, I will be seeing it soon. I do hope, however, that I can see it on the big screen because everyone, their brother, is like, "That's the way you have to see it. <laughs> it's the true way to see it." And I believe what they're saying, but I just hope I get that experience. Sure, sure. Yeah, I definitely uh, see this one. I see Quaron getting a Best Director nomination. Part of the reason I think this will win Best Picture is because I think they're going to give Quaron the Best Director. And uh, there tends to be a pretty solid link between Best Director and Best uh, Motion Picture. So that's Roma. Uh, uh, you know, I was going between a B plus and an A minus, And uh, I, I kind of am at an A- minus at this point uh, because I do think it is a must-see. And I'm having difficulty kind of like bumping it down to the B area. So about you were going to say something? No, I was going to say, I mean, we have uh, at the Oscars of late, it's more of a divide between we have. best picture and best director. We but have. I do think this one might be an example of a film winning both. Although I don't know. I don't it think the rule's like been it's... broken forever. So Yeah, I mean, I think I've said this before. I, I, I still think A Star is Born is probably going to win, but it's hard to know yeah. this early in the game. But we'll see. All right, well, that is Roma. Uh, let's talk about another film that you and I have seen finally, Creed 2. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, well, Ashton, what did, walk us through. What, what is the sequel? What, is this another Rocky movie? What's going on? Uh, technically, yeah. Well, I mean, I guess it depends on how you feel uh, Creed is, if it's more of a spinoff or a sequel to Rocky. But, yeah, it's a bit of both. It's um, continuing the story that Ryan Coogler made with um, Creed 1 that was in 2015 to much acclaim and uh, commercial success. Um, Sylvester Stallone got nominated for an Oscar for the film, and I think everyone was really taken aback by not only that it was good, but as good as it was. A film that was able to be very personal and prestigiously well-made and engaging and poignant and thoughtful while being technically the eighth, or no, seventh rocky movie that's right yeah so yeah it, it's 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 a film that um going into creed 2 there were a lot of expectations maybe or there was a lot of hope would maybe be a better word that it would continue to keep that excellence or at least have some of that goodness that was um not quite apparent in the rocky sequels depending on how you feel about those um which i tend to like most of the rocky sequels but not in the same way that i like rocky one I think Rocky One is just a genuinely really good, great film about uh, you know a man kind of persevering through the odds and proving himself. Whereas the sequels are kind of schlocky and silly, and they like have robots and Mr. <laughs> T and all this stuff, which is fun. I mean, they're they're enjoyable to watch, but they're a lot cheesier and sillier. And thankfully, this sequel B two is it's keeping the grounded to, uh, kind of thoughtful style that was in Creed One. It's not really going for the silliness angle, even though Sylvester Stallone had much uh, bigger hand in this film. He co-wrote it as well as producing it. And I think you can tell his influence is pretty apparent through here because even though it's mostly Creed's story, it Rocky's story kind of keeps coming back in here. And I don't really think what they're doing with Rocky is that different than what we did last time. And I felt like the way they ended it for his character the last time was a lot stronger and a little more meaningful than here, even though some of us alone is trying to end the character on his own terms. Uh, reportedly, this is going to be his last time playing the character. 
Um, I, I found myself kind of at odds with Vaughn's ability to blend those two characters as seamlessly as I did last time. However, I did enjoy the film. I think it's a solid sequel. Even though it's a little by books and its approach, I think there's enough in here as far as the performances and the writing and the characters that um, I, I, I found myself pretty engaged and entertained. And uh, I hope you liked it, too. I don't, I don't know how you feel about this one, John. Oh, no. Um, yeah, we agree quite a bit on the Rocky films. I think the first one is just a fantastic film. It's, and yeah. you should you know, give Sylvester Stallone credit. He did write and direct that one. Yeah, and that's picture winner. Right. And so I, I, I love that film because of its writing and uh, because it, you know, it, it, it's got that Americana feel to it of uh, the kind of every man rising above, you know, his, his status and going the distance. And well, one of the things that I love about this franchise that, you know, kind of continues with Creed too is that the fights don't always end the way that you expect them. Um, sometimes things are a little bit more complicated and, you know, characters don't always win. Um, if I recall the, the last Creed, he doesn't win in the very end. He, it's a draw. No. Um, but like the first Rocky where he also doesn't win in that one, uh, he actually technically loses. He still goes the distance. And so I like that the films aren't afraid of letting these characters lose. And Creed 2 definitely is, has some moments like that, that, you know, have the unexpectedness, but then to what you're saying, it, 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 yes, there's so much predictability, you know, what's going to happen. It's a, it's a Rocky film. You know what these characters are going to go through. You know that, you know, at at one point Adonis Creed is going to be down and then he's going to be up and then maybe he's going to be down again. Uh, And you see all of it coming, but you know, they, they do, they do manage to make this thing have the Rocky DNA that I think Stallone does have a knack for, which even in those Rocky sequels, even in all their campiness and their cheesiness, and I I don't think this one's campy or cheesy, they do sort of have those moments that just make you want to punch the air and they're just uplifting Mm -hmm. in their simplicity and in their just sort of spirit. And so Creed 2 is is interesting because to what you're saying, I think the first Creed reminded me much more of the first Rocky. Creed 2 is kind of a lot of the Rocky sequels molded into one. It's a lot of those stories yeah. all sort of roll together. Um, you know, you even have Adonis Creed going up against one of his nemeses in the first Creed. Uh, I forget the name of that boxer, but that's kind of how the film starts is, you know, you see him, you know, getting to the heights of, you know, heavyweight champion of the world. And it's like, man, where do you go from here? And But I think what makes the picture really work is Michael B. Jordan's family life in this one, which I do think even though Stallone inserts himself in a lot of different places, I think it works because there's more emphasis on Adonis and, of course, his girlfriend is back here played by Tessa Thompson and kind of how they're dealing with, you know, his circumstances, his career, what it means for him to be a fighter. I think the film does, you know, have issues in the first half in terms of motivation. I constantly was wondering, why does he care so much about this drama from Rocky IV? Why why does it bother him so much? I mean, I, there is sort of like lip service to this idea that, okay, this is the son of the man who killed his father. But then the first Creed, I guess, was supposed to be about creating your own legacy, sort of dismantling, you know, maybe it's time to let the old ways die, as Bradley yep. Cooper uh, sang to us not so long ago. And so there, the, for me, there was a bit of a weird tension there between is he unlearning lessons or was this just something he never fully dealt with? And you know, to the film's credit, it sort of dispenses with a lot of that and then focuses on the good stuff, which is, okay, he really is struggling with how do I be a father? How do I be a good husband? How do I, you know, how do I take care of of my boxing coach who needs to have a life of his own and who needs to sort of, you know, deal with the drama that he has with his own kid? Uh, There's good stuff in there. I think one of the highlights of this film is that there's a kind of a, a breakdown of the relationship between him and Rocky that that was the first moment in this film where I was like, I'm in this, this is what I want to see because you know, th- this isn't, this isn't going to be as straightforward as, you know, some of the plot elements can say that they are sort of doing things in, in interesting ways with these characters. I especially wanted to, to say with Dolph Lundgren, who they actually pulled an interesting story out of, you know, this, this Soviet Russia boxer from the eighties who really was a cartoon character in Rocky mm-hmm. four. And they gave break. him, <laughs> they gave him 
uh, a backstory. They gave him a purpose. They gave him, you know, something to care about, really, besides just sort of being a tool for, you know, American Russian politics. Here, he's kind of his own person, and you, the relationship he has with his son is it's interesting. It's it's kind of a a, a brilliant idea that this movie starts with them, and. There's less I can say about Florian Montenu, uh, who plays his son, but I did really appreciate that, you know, he, it's not the same, he's not the same fighter. Uh, you know, the, he is in some ways, but whereas Dolph Lundgren and uh, Ivan Drago, where his Drago was, you know, he was a machine. He was like a robot. Uh, his son is like a, a beast, right? You know, he's, he's a bit more primal, you know, he, he's doing like the workouts that Rocky was doing, you know, out in the wilderness and you know, fighting nature itself. It, it was, I think, less of a robotic mechanical performance, which I think was just a smart spin on something that they could have been way more predictable about. So th- that's where I'm at with Creed too. Yeah, nowhere near as good as the first Creed. I think that the first Creed had a lot of things going for it that this film never could had in its arsenal. But, and even though it doesn't have all the flashy one-take boxing scenes, it, it gets all the things right. And it has that satisfying final fight that is just going to get people to remember, that's why I love all yeah. of the uh, the uh, these Rocky movies. That's what makes me yeah. love them. So, yeah. That uh, that Rocky theme is better than some drugs. I will say that. <laughs> like, just so so at, at the right moment, it, it is perfect. Exactly. Um, yeah, no, I agree. I, I agree with what a lot of you're saying, especially about Drago. Um, I, I think this is a good showcase for um, Dolph Lundgren as an actor, yeah. you know, kind of proving, you know, like, taking ownership of his most iconic character, but giving it a little more grounded weight that was definitely not there the first time. And, uh, yeah, if anything, I just wanted more of Drago this time. I wanted more of that dynamic they're talking about between his son. And I heard uh, the director, Stephen Capel Jr., is actually considering, I believe, making a spinoff about Drago. And I don't know if that ever will come to be, but I would certainly be interested to see that based on what they brought uh, to this film. But, yeah, I, I mean, it, overall, I think you said pretty well. Like It's, it's a solid sequel uh, it, it basically lived up to what my expectations were, even though I knew going in that it wasn't going to be Creed 1. I just wanted it to be a respectful sequel to it, um, one that kept the themes going uh, and, uh, you know, just served that film well. And I think that's what this film does. Um, I'm hoping, though, that the next film is a little less about Rocky and more about Creed. Like, I think this film, I mean, it's it's a fine finale for um, Sylvester Stallone, but I really don't that this is going to be the end i think he'll want to play the character again if he can and if that's the case i, I don't really want it to be another situation where stallone kind of takes over film again i kind of want it to be like maybe like a glorified cameo at most hmm. um but yeah no I, I i think it's a solid sequel i, I gave it a, i believe i gave it a b i was between a b and a b minus but i think as it stands it's a, a, a solid b film i gave it a b as well yeah it's uh it, it's definitely solid. Um, yeah, the only thing that I would add is that I think that you can tell that they cut a lot of things out. I think that there probably was a lot more in the uh, the original cut of this with more with Lundgren. I heard there was definitely more supposed to be going on with Tessa Thompson's character. Um, yeah, I was bummed she wasn't in it as much either. Yeah, but those those scenes do work. Um, and yeah, they do. Yeah. There, there was there was that one scene where uh, the Drago you know, family sort of has a bit of a reckoning and it, yeah, that was one of those scenes where I was like, Oh yeah, that has some life to it. I like that. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, that's Creed two. Uh, we both, we both definitely liked it. I, I'm glad we were both finally able to catch it and talk about yeah. it on the show. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. I have another one. Um, another one of my favorite films of the year. Would you look Thanks. at that? So the favorite, yeah, Yes, this is a top 10 movie of 2018 for me. I don't see how it could Can't get wait. bumped off the list. Uh, I cannot wait for you to see this film, Will Ashton. Um, even if you dislike it immensely, it'll just oh, I think be I'm going to talk like about it. it. Uh, um, yeah. I, I do think I, it's, this is going to be the one that I like more than you and Maverick Hines. You both are big oh, really? fans of Yorgos Lanthimos. I do. I think that you like a certain flair of his direction style. I'm just predicting that uh, I don't think is 100% in the favorite. And I think that's why I like the favorite a little bit more than Lobster and Dog Tooth. So not dry and as dark, I guess. Is that what you're it's saying? It's not as dry. It is still dry. Uh, it is still pretty dark. But it's just okay. there is more of a comedy here. Um, uh, that's more of like on its sleeve comedy, right? Where I, I don't I don't think you would say about Killing of a Sacred Deer. But in Lobster, that movie is hysterical. 
But, you know, it's the sort of comedy that most people aren't going to get or appreciate. The favorite is something that I think a wider audience could actually oh, yeah, see through. I could do that. Yeah, it's it's far more accessible. And to some people, that's uh, a criticism against it. For me, it's not. I actually think that it's a testament to how good the story is here. So the favorite is a anachronistic, historical, period, comedy, drama. Uh, a lot of words, but that really nails <laughs> it, I think, um, in terms of everything this film is doing. Unlike uh, other Yorgos Lanthimos films, he did direct this. However, the screenplay is from Deborah Davis and Tony McNamara. Um, Deborah Davis, I believe, not a newcomer, but uh, definitely not as well known as McNamara and Lanthimos. Uh, so this film is uh, quite a, a showcase of actresses. Uh, we have Olivia Coleman, who I think is a shoe in for, uh, if not best actress, best supporting actress. Uh, we have Emma Stone, Rachel Weisz, uh, and they make up really the trio that powers this film. Nicholas Holt also has a role, uh, but really is sort of like the the circus gesture character in some ways. Uh, so this follows the the reign of Queen Anne, uh, who was the British monarch, uh, I believe, in the early 18th century. And, you know, we, we've seen a lot of period dramas before where royalty sort of has, like, they have their favorite person, right? And we follow Queen Anne's favorite, uh, somebody who's always at her side. Uh, this is uh, the lady of the court, um, Sarah Churchill, who is her confidant, her advisor, and maybe something else, as we start to learn as we watch the film. And the two of them, uh, you know, we watch their daily lives where Queen Anne, you know, she's she's kind of acts like a toddler. You know, there's a war going on with France, but she barely even knows that it's going on. Uh, she's uh, very timely. demanding. Exactly, exactly. And when are they not at war, right? I think in her defense. <laughs> um, but no, she she's a very, you know, when the, the film first pre presents her, you get this picture of someone who needs to be babysat. And who is to babysit her? But of course, Sarah. And, you know, as you can expect from Rachel Weiss, she's strong. She's confident. She's the only person in Queen Anne's life who, you know, actually tells her things that she doesn't want to hear, who doesn't just say things to to make her happy, but tells her the truth, as it were. And so you watch their, their, their relationship sort of unfold. But in the distance, you have a servant who is rising through the uh, ranks. She's actually distantly related to Sarah. She... Her name is Abigail. She's played by Emma Stone, uh, much younger than the two main leads. She comes in and she starts to court favor herself with Queen Anne. And uh, you can sort of see her playing her own Game of Thrones, as you can imagine. And we start to learn more about everyone's different backstories. And th this is one of those films. It's like a dark Downton Abbey of who wants what when um, characters are going to absurd lengths to undermine each other. Uh, you know, certain scenes, uh, and I mentioned anachronistic before because there, there are dance numbers in here. I don't want to say they're like a knight's tale or anything like that, but you know, th there is sort of this like playful insanity behind the, the staging of this that, uh, is just a thrill to watch. It, it's always funny. Uh, and even in the way some of these scenes are shot, you have sh scenes where you're in this very authentic looking castle where these characters kind of live and operate. And every once in a while, the camera will switch to a fisheye lens and it's strange and it's disorienting and it sort of boxes you in. And, you know, it sort of reminds you that you're watching these people in private moments and it makes you kind of rethink context. And I can see for a lot of people it not exactly working uh, as a filmmaking device. Uh, it's not, I think... Uh, Something like Alfonso Cuaron's, you know, experimentation, which tends to really just work in sort of the, why didn't I think of that sort of way. Here, it sort of comes off as a gimmick in some parts. But what does not come off as a gimmick is just this the story and the way that it comes to life with these three women. It's enchanting. It's, it's so, it, it goes to some expected places, some unexpected places. And it, when it all comes together, there is a moment that recontextualizes Olivia Coleman's performance that uh, it was truly one of my favorite character turns in the last year. This is one of my favorite films of the year. I think that it's just a, a true treasure. It's one of those films that uh, I cannot wait to recommend to people who love this time period, who maybe want some more challenging cinema uh, in terms of like, it's not, you know, 
the sort of period drama that's, you know, surface level ideas and, you know, the tutors or I guess the tutors isn't a good example because that one gets kind of ridiculous at certain points. But you know what I mean? I mentioned Down Abbey before. Perhaps that's a better comparison. Uh, I, I do think there's so much to love here. And I think a lot of people are really going to love it. So I actually gave it an A minus. So that's the favorite. And uh, it's not taking the box office by storm. It's a three and a half million uh, off of a 15 million budget, but it's still a limited release. So hopefully it's going to expand. And uh, I think some awards attention is going to uh, make it a very modest hit, I hope. Yeah, I see it Wednesday and I honestly cannot wait. I say that a lot on this show, but this is one of those movies. I'm like, I really, really want to see this because it looks fantastic. And what I- were your expectations? I, I want you to to go into it and then not hate it. So <laughs> I don't think I'm going to hate it, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try to keep myself in check. Yeah. Sure. Control your excitement. Will Ashton for check all our myself sakes. Before I wreck myself. Oh, before you Shrek yourself, you mean, because next you're uh, going to yeah. be talking about Shrek retold. Will, we what is Shrek retold? Why is it happening? It's funny enough that you, um, you we, we did that catchphrase because that was actually, um, a name I was debating calling my podcast, the Andover Toad's Ogre. Uh, yeah, so Shrek Retold, uh, it, it's not a theatrical film, but it is, uh, it's interesting. <laughs> it, it is uh, 200, actually, I think more than 200 YouTube creators got together and uh, each individually remade one scene from the 2001 Best Pitch or Best Anime Feature winning film, Shrek. Now, here's so, what I don't understand. You yeah. did not do a scene of your own. No, I, I am a little bummed that Matt and I were not asked to make a scene <laughs> for the film. And I, I'm not going to hold that against the film. Which but scene I, would it you is have a done? It, 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 it is a little heartbreak. I, I really think it would have been fun <laughs> to have been involved. But no matter. Which, uh, which, yeah. But which scene would you have done? I have to know. Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't quite... I was going to bring this up. I don't quite know how this, this worked. Like, So each... Each scene is, um, I think, given to like probably like three or four different people. Mm-hmm. So like they'll, they'll have like a scene where like it'll be a like, 2D animation, and then it'll be like stick animation. But it's like the same scene, just like the next shot. Hmm. And then it'll go back to the one before, and then it'll be a live action actor. And like so, the film constantly switches styles and tones. Like there's some motion, there's a lot of CG animation, there's a lot of uh, hand drawn animation. A lot of live action recreation. So it's kind of like a Swede version of the film. S W E. Great reference. Yeah. It's kind of like, I was telling you off the air, it's kind of like what I was hoping Be Kind Rewind would be. Hmm. Um, that, that movie might be dating myself. It's, uh, the, was that 2008? Uh, With Jack Black and. Um, 2008, Mosef. 2007, maybe. Yeah. Where, like, I'm trying to remember the films that were in that that they were referencing, and I'm trying to like, think of more and modern. Stuff, like, Oh, yes. it's it's 2008. You're right. Yeah. So like in that film, like they they kind of get together and they like, try to remake a bunch of films that were destroyed in their video store. And this film, it's just it's more I think about the love of creativity and like kind of owning up to the films that you love and just unabashedly being fans of them. But it's interesting because I was kind of expecting the film to be more ironic. And there are a couple of people in the film that like, clearly just don't care about the film. There's one segment in the film where the guy admits he hasn't seen the film. <laughs> and it's the uh, it's a moment where Shrek and Donkey reunite. And oh, no. so that just it's not in the film. It just the guy just be like, yeah, I, uh, I just didn't watch Shrek. <laughs> <laughs> OK, and uh, that exists uh, now. But there are but there's many. There's actually so like the scene like they recreate with um where Donkey finds uh, Fiona as an ogre, and like they talk about Shrek. Like that was a like, film with like actual actors in like uh, I think Brooklyn, and it's like one of the best acted scenes I've seen all year. What? Like it's generally really touching scene, and like it's just I think that's it's a great example of like how like acting if you have really good actors, no matter what the material is, you can transcend it. Hmm. Not to say the material is bad, but like it just when you don't really think about like oh it's kind of weird that they're like. Like it's not, they're not in costume or anything. It's just like them talking, like saying the actual lines, like doing it in like a human realistic fashion. <laughs> and it's really kind of heartbreaking and sweet. And the movie, it's on YouTube. I, I think it has like 200 or 2 million views by this point, maybe more. It's, it's a, it's a trip. I, I think 
your mileage might vary depending on how you feel about the film Shrek. I would definitely recommend seeing the film, like or having some knowledge of the film Shrek beforehand, because I don't think you can watch this film and really know what's going on unless you have already seen Shrek. Uh, but the sense, I think you know, I'm biased obviously because I did a podcast last year where we watched Shrek 12 times and we talked about it. I know the film backwards and forwards by now, so like for me, it was just kind of fun to see how everyone approached the story and how they kind of interpreted different scenes and stuff like that but i don't think it's going to be for everyone but for me i really enjoyed it i think it's honestly one of the best animated films i've seen this year um i think it's really well done and i gave it a b plus so what you're saying is it is a shrek fan film with layers yep there you there go you go there 200 you go. layers to be exact <laughs> yeah it's that's that's oh, a beautiful yeah. way to put it John. let's let's go on to uh <laughs> Our next film. <laughs> sure, that's Shrek retold. I'm so glad you checked this out. I can't wait to see it myself. Um, because you know I love let me Shrek. know what you think. Yeah. I will absolutely let you know. It's on. Uh, I have it tabbed and ready to go. So yeah, it's on YouTube. If, yeah. you want, if you want to check it out. All right. Uh, next we have Vox Lux. So Vox Lux, uh, I, I had the privilege to see this one uh, with the director present, um, Brady Corbett. Who I, I think you said you were a fan on a recent episode. Yeah. Oh, I, I like his film. Yeah. His uh, first film, which is. Uh, the, the childhood of a leader, which I haven't seen Vox Lux, but I really like that film. Right, right. Uh, which uh, is still on my list. But uh, yeah, so so Brady Corbett, uh, he wrote and directed Vox Lux. The stars Natalie Portman and Jude Law, Rafi Cassidy, Stacey Martin, and Jennifer Ailey. So this film, you know, we, we I kind of went into it not knowing too much about the setup. I know last week I, I didn't really fully understand uh, the premise here, but now I obviously do. Uh, so this is based on a fictional uh, character. This is based on a, a singer who, when we first meet her, it's 1999, uh, about to be the year 2000, and a young girl named Celeste. Uh, she's first played by Rafi Cassidy. You, you actually don't meet the Natalie Portman version of this character, who is uh, Celeste grown up until later in the film. Uh, it opens with a tragedy that's sort of uh, projects Celeste into being a uh, nationally famous person because at a uh, funeral that happens after this tragedy, she sings a very moving song that becomes an instant hit. So the film chronicles her life, uh, you know, as she deals with this fame and essentially becomes a pop star. She works with her older sister, um, Ellie, who's played by Stacey Martin. And the two sisters, you know, they help each other create the music and they use music to sort of cope with catastrophe and tragedy. And uh, eventually a, a manager is hired by them, played by Jude Law. And he sort of navigates them through in the first half, you know, the, the pitfalls of fame and, and how they can use this career to really make something of themselves. The film then jumps to Natalie Portman. Uh, she's in her 30s now. And we see what that fame has done to her, how it's strained her relationships. And we see somebody is, it really is an amalgamation of a lot of different singers and people like over the years. And this very much is a film about what celebrities deal with, uh, how celebrities are analyzed by the press and by their fans. It's about how celebrity behavior can be really be understood by tragedy and catastrophe, as I was saying. There is a kind of unique connection here between terrorism, you know, people who you know, do very violent acts and celebrities who sometimes get caught up in that. Uh, you know, I, I think this film is being made in the, uh, the aftermath or I, I don't want to say this for sure, but I think with uh, Ariana Grande had to cancel a concert because of a, of a shooting that happened there. That's not to say anything that didn't, happens plot wise in here, but I think this film you're going to say. Did that shooting actually happen during her concert? That's what I wasn't sure about. So it, it's a little unclear and, uh, I think there is some sort of like tie there and I have a feeling it played its way into the script. But again, I'm not saying that that actually happens in this movie, right. but you do have that sort of context for a sort of anything can happen because, you know, there is a scene where people put on masks that remind of um, Celeste's, uh, one of her music videos, and they sort of like mimic her as they do a very violent thing. So that's kind of what this film is dealing with. It's feeling, it's dealing with the way that, People handle tragedy, you know, national tragedies. You know, this this film happens during the course of 9-11, for example. And, you know, but then it also contextualizes it through how a celebrity deals with it. Uh, I do not like this movie. Uh, I think that it is very bad. 
And uh, I'm, I th- I'm very sad to say that because I like the ideas here. I, I think that the, it is it, it is an interesting premise. Uh, Willem Dafoe does the narration, for example, which is a, kind of an interesting touch. It, it's an experimental film. This is probably the theme of this episode of Cinemaholics is so many experimental films are getting talked about. And certainly this is one where that is the case. And I, I think that if, for people who love film, they owe it to themselves to at least try and see this. They, they might like it. I know it's been getting rave reviews, but... Uh, I'm not going to say anyone is misguided, but I, I do think that there's something in the water at some of these theaters because I think that this film truly fails to do what it sets out to do because it takes great ideas and presents them in the blandest way possible. And it's such a shame because the performances here are pitch perfect, pun intended. You know, Natalie Portman really sells this this really curmudgeonly celebrity with bad behavior that you want to see her sort of, uh, you know, interact with other characters. You, you buy it. You, you buy what she's doing with this role. I think Natalie Portman is a fantastic actress. I think Black Swan and Jackie have proved that she is very capable of roles like this. The problem with Vox Lux is that everything is at A level except for the script. The dialogue and a lot of the plot here is it ranges from incoherent to just straight boring, most obvious thing a character would say in that situation. There are no surprises in the dialogue. There's no richness. Uh, it, it's the kind of thing where you don't know good dialogue. You don't appreciate good dialogue until it's not there. And because normally we take it for granted, but when you have these characters talking to each other, it feels so much like not even the first draft. It feels like the rejected draft that the intern wrote up and nobody had the courage to edit it. Uh, it, It's so unfortunate because I, I just truly wonder what prevented anybody working on this film with all of the, the wonderful, you know, voices and, and crew behind this, uh, so many fantastic filmmakers, including Brady Corbett based on reputation alone. Um, I, I just really got the sense that this thing was unfiltered to a fault. And I think it's a real slog to get through. And then it's other sin is because if it was just the script, I would maybe be lower B level on this, but what really kills it is the climax, the final act. I've heard some people say that it's fantastic. I think it's it's absolutely atrocious. It's like, what if Whiplash, but boring? And that really bummed me out because it, it was this film's moment to sort of bring it all together and sort of salvage what's there. And it really just plays off in a way that made me question how much they were paying Sia, who did the original music here. Uh, because, the, the, again, though, the music is good. I, I think that uh, one of the early songs that Rafi Cassidy performs is it's beautiful. I, I saved it to my Apple Music. Uh, I think the score here by Scott Walker is hauntingly beautiful. All of that really works, but there's just a final, you know, pair of scenes or sequence of scenes, I suppose, that happen that are just truly, truly awful, I thought. I, I just found it uh, just absolutely devoid of anything experiential or engaging. Um, I think it's the experience that, uh, it's one of those experiences that I, I deeply am sad about because this is a film with so much potential and one that I was really rooting for. Uh, just last week, Will Ashton, I was saying that this was one of my most anticipated of the winter season, and I'm sad to say it let me down uh, quite a bit. Um, I give it a C. Uh, fortunately, there's so much to like here that you know it. It really is. It, it yes. It uh, it really sort of balances out on that curve. Um, but no, I I think that uh, Vox Lux sucks. And uh, I, hopefully that's just me. Something going on with me that just it didn't click with me. But uh, I worry that that's going to happen for a lot of people who do go seek this out based on these fantastic reviews. I I just. I, I don't see it. <laughs> so uh, I, I worry about some of the reception from from uh, from general audiences, but we'll see what happens. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, I've, I've heard very, very divisive things about the film. It seems like nobody has the same opinion, which actually excites me a little bit. I, yeah. I really, I'm actually honestly looking forward to the film, even though you're not a fan of it, because, because like people who have liked it have really, really liked it to the point where I'm like, I don't, I guess it's just one of those films where you either yeah. like it or you don't, and I don't know where I'll stand on it, but given the fact that I liked his first film a lot, I feel like I'll probably at least appreciate this one. But it's interesting. You know, even um, 
sometimes like a film like this, people will be like, oh, like you know, I didn't really care for the film, but the performance is good. Like I've even heard people criticize Natalie Portman's performance. Uh, Katie Walsh from, uh, or I guess at one point the playlist now she writes elsewhere. She was even saying that's like a Razzie Wardy performance. So <laughs> I'm curious. The um, I I can't hundred percent disagree with her because there there are moments in here. I don't think it's her though. I think it's the dialogue. Uh, yeah, I think that it is sort of the thing where you you can blame her, but I don't think it's the way she's delivering it. I just think it's the words themselves are bad. But yeah, okay, yeah. I mean that's unfortunate to hear, but um, yeah. I'll, I'll definitely be checking it out and uh, we'll see where I stand. Yeah. Uh, I hope, I hope this is one of those films. I hope it makes your top five. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> and I did forget to mention this is from neon, uh, a studio that I, I genuinely, you know, seek out because I, I love how bold their films are. Uh, mm-hmm. Unfortunately, this just didn't quite cut it for me personally. So, yeah. So it's kind of like, uh, is this this year's I, Tanya, I guess. Well, I really liked Atania, so... Well, no, but I thought it was another film that got kind of mixed response. That's true, that's true. But I think on, so. I think the mixed response with that one was a little bit more about uh, subject matter, more so than... I think people liked the filmmaking, for the most part, in Itania. And here, I think people are just really not responding to the filmmaking in some of the... Mm. But I don't know, I'd, I'd have to read yeah. some more reviews, honestly, because I've only sort of surface-level seen some of the reactions to Vox Lux, so I'm not sure if it's similar All right, in yeah. that sense, yeah. But okay, that is Vox Lux. Uh, I, I don't recommend it, but I, again, if you love film uh, and especially you will ask, and I think you should see it because I think it is one yeah, of those okay. bad films that hopefully you would have an opinion on and sure. maybe you, you would consider it good. Yeah, no, I was just living because I knew that was going to be your response. Just like, well, I don't recommend <laughs> it, but uh, well, you should check it out anyway. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. The Shivering Truth Season 1. Will, what's this one? All right. Yeah, this is the new Adult Swim show, and uh, I think that kind of sets you up to know what it's about, but I I will try my best to explain what this show is. It's um, this new show from creator and writer Vernon Chapman. Vernon Chapman is, uh, I think, I guess best known as the creator of The Heart, Heart She Hollers. I don't know if you remember that show, John, but... Um, he is also involved with a couple other shows that I'm thinking you know, I'll look up in a minute. Oh, um, uh, Wonder Chosen. Remember that? Wonder no, Chosen. no, I, I'm uh, not as familiar with this guy. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, he, he's been around. He actually... Uh, he wrote on South Park, I know that. Oh, yeah, that's true. And uh, he's also the credited co-writer of um, I Love You, Daddy, which is probably something he wants to be remembered for. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so he's, he's been around to block a lot. And uh, the show, I... I described it to you before we started recording as like a Don Hertzfeld cartoon animated in the style of Anomalisa. Um, Truly a bizarre know. description. Yeah, it's it's well, I mean, the show itself is very very bizarre. It's basically so there there are six episodes in a pilot, so there's seven episodes all together. The mm-hmm. show premieres tonight at midnight, so in about half an hour from us since we're recording this one pretty late. But all the episodes are now available online. If you have to kind of find them. Because they, they put them on a bunch of different platforms. But if you check them out, um, each one is probably even weirder than the last. And they all are just kind of talking about the meaninglessness of life and how through our chaos and lack of reason, we have reason. And I know it sounds very broad, but I feel like if I got more into the specifics of the show, <laughs> it, it would turn people off. Like there's, um, let's see, there's one episode involves a freelance suicide hotline caller who uh, finds himself in a conversation with the man who uh, every time he tries to kill himself, uh, like he ends up saving people's lives or like finding all these riches and all this different stuff. Uh, there's another scene involving a kid's like open cut, uh, kind of having like a little shop of horrors relationship where he has to be fed milk and chili through the boy's nipple. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it gets very, very strange. As you do. Um, yeah, it, at one point, a howl turns into Abraham Lincoln said, um, it, it, it's like, it's very much like catered to the, uh, like stone drunk audience that probably turns on adult swim on Sunday, not sure what to expect and getting this. And, uh, cause the animation is honestly some of the best, uh, stop motion animation I've seen in a while. I don't know if it was, um, Starburn's company that did it, but it's made in their style. And you can tell whoever was involved with it did a really good job. It's like gorgeously grotesque animation. And that like what you're seeing, you probably 
don't want to watch in the sense that it's just kind of weird and uncomfortable, but it's so well put together and so like consistently uh, hard to predict what's going to happen next that you just kind of allured into it. And I cannot imagine it's going to work for everybody, but I think for the set audience, it's really going to do wonders. And if you have a sense of humor that I guess is similar to mine, you're really going to dig it. So I would, I guess, watch the pilot first. I, I, I watch them out of order, but I think if you watch the pilot, you'll know one way or the other where you stand on the show. If you're like, Ugh, this is not me, totally understand. Uh, it's going to really gross and weird some people out. Uh, if you do kind of like something a little more obscure and not uh, at all what you typically see, as far as animation is concerned, I think you'll have a lot of fun watching the show. It's it's only 11 minutes each episode, and I can guarantee you, you are not going to know how each episode is going to end, because they go very, very strange. If, uh, I, if I, I like yeah. Moral Oral, does that mean I will like this? Kind of. Well, Moral Oral is more, it's not quite as surreal as The Shivering Truth, which is like... That's saying something. Yeah, because I mean, I mean, Moral Oral was the thing about that was like, that was kind of ahead of its time. That was kind of like a BoJack Horseman hmm. Before Jack Horseman, I, awesome. I'm trying to figure because I feel like a lot of our listeners may not even remember Moral Oral. That was from a little while ago. Uh, but yeah, I, I think if you liked Moral Oral, you'll probably dig this. I mean, if you just kind of dig the general style of Adult Swim kind of absurdist, like uh, dark humor. I've, at times I do. A lot of times I don't. Yeah, like, there's a lot of Adult Swim favorites I know people really love that I've just never clicked with. But like, I think that's uh, Aqua Teen Hunger Force, Aqua Teen, uh, the Venture Brothers. Uh, okay, I, I know people really love that stuff, and it's just something that's not for me. I guess I don't sure. Know. Yeah, I, I mean, I I think Aqua Teen kind of gets a little too much praise. I, I think that's like kind of like a weird like stoner SpongeBob thing for some people, and I never really got a, a hold of that. But um, the, cl- I remember not- the clips from the early seasons, I, I did get a kick out of. So I, I, I mean, I do like Meet Watt, the character, but I do. Yeah. There's something about that show that is like off putting in a way that I don't even like. Uh, um, but yeah, no, yeah. Um, but no, I think you, I think you'd actually would appreciate um, the sharing truth, John, <laughs> based on uh, what you tend to enjoy. I don't, I don't think you're going to love it wholeheartedly, but I think there's going to be some gags in here that are really going to throw you back. Yeah. All right. Well, I I will give it a shot along with okay, Shrek I'll, I'll send you the pilot. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So the Shivering Truth, the first season, uh, is the first season complete yet? Or yeah, it's, okay. all the episodes are online. Um, okay. Yeah. If you, I, I know some sites actually have them all like okay. there. If you if you just do a quick Google search, search you'll find it. So all yeah. right. Okay, unfortunately, I think we only have time for for one more. I was worried this was going to happen. We had even more films we wanted to talk about, uh, including a couple that mm. I know you've been wanting to talk about for a while. So I guess we'll just have to do another catch up episode soon. Our, our Lindsay Buckingham episode. <laughs> months, like we just never get around to them, but promise them. <laughs> I kind of like that though. I like the there, there's one in particular that's going to come right after this one that's been on yeah. the list for <laughs> I don't even know how long. But um, no, I I do want to get to this one at least because it is a Christmas Eve movie, uh, Anna and the Apocalypse. Uh, Right, is this one on your radar, Will? Are you going to be able to check it out? I think you said it that, is. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think it's actually coming here, unfortunately. I, I tried to lobby before at our theater, and unfortunately, I didn't get it approved, or it didn't hmm. come through, or whatever they he forgot about, it or something. I don't know. But I really wanted it to come here, and I don't think it's going to, unfortunately. But whenever it hits VOD, I'll check it out. For those of you who don't know, Will Ashton sort of runs the indie scene in Pittsburgh. No, now. I don't. Don't don't. Uh, don't <laughs> I don't. Okay, sorry. I won't put ideas in people's heads. Uh, anyway, this premiered at Fantastic Fest last year, uh, and in the Apocalypse, finally coming out, and uh, it is a Christmas zombie musical. And if you're already interested, is this the movie for you? It was directed by John McPhail, and it was written by Alan McDonald and Ryan McHenry. Uh, it, it's actually based on a short film called Zombie Musical. Uh, but I believe this one has the Christmas spin. I think that was added for this. Uh, it takes place in this town called Little Haven. It's Christmas time. And we sort of like fall into the lives of these uh, high school students. They they wear like, you know, uniforms. So it's like a private school. And uh, our main character is Anna. She, you know, she's kind of disillusioned with her life. She she hates her sleepy town in Ireland. And she just wants to, to go to Australia and kind of just go on adventures and, you know, sort of uh, break away from the monotony of high school. 
Uh, she has a lot of different friends. Uh, she has a best friend who wear, who's very cheesy. You know, clearly he's in the friend zone and in, is in love with her. He's a really nice guy who quotes Rudolph songs. And uh, she has a, a pair of friends who are a couple. And they're always all over each other. Uh, she has sort of this, uh, there's this bully character that she may have had like a thing with at one point, And he's kind of a, just a really, uh, you know, jerky kind of dude. And, you know, as the movie starts out, you know, you get little hints that there's something that's going to go down. I mean, the opening credits like really land that, oh, this kind of has a horror tint to it. Uh, but it takes its time. You, you get to know these characters and, you know, kind of what their different plot points are. And uh, you can start to make your predictions of who's going to die and all those things. And uh, eventually, the film drops all pretense, and it reveals itself as a musical. And all of a sudden, characters start singing like they're in a Disney film. And when I say Disney, I'm being very specific. This is high school musical production value level, um, where these characters are doing the 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 ADR and the, the the voice work I should say and then all of the the dancing and everything it's it's on that level where it's very high school musical they're singing about oh you know you know life doesn't have Hollywood endings and uh, you know they sing about things like uh, I just want to be a tough guy and uh, oh I want the girl I like to to like me back so all of this is going on uh, one of the films by the way peak scenes before a lot of the chaos breaks out is a uh, very suggestive, and by very suggestive, I mean completely suggestive to the point of true hilarity. It's it's one of the film's best moments, is uh, one of the characters sings a uh, a seductive Santa song uh, that really takes a lot of like the Christmas, uh, you know, mannerisms and phrases and puts like a very, uh, you know, sexual spin on them. And it's fantastic and it's hilarious and it's one of the film's best moments. But that said, uh, the, what I'm trying to say overall, of course, is that the film has pretty good music. I, I think that if the Disney Channel thing annoys you, at least in this, you have the thing to fall back on that these characters are also getting massacred by zombies. So <laughs> there's sort of a, a weird, sick uh, delight that people can derive from this. But uh, that said, zombies do happen. Uh, these characters go into survival mode. They have to figure out, okay, we have to go find our friends and reunite with these people. We have to go here. And it becomes sort of just a zombie film. There, there's nothing really to it that feels all that different from other zombie films. You'll think a lot about Dawn of the Dead. In fact, I kind of call this the Dawn of the Dead Christmas special, but in Ireland. And, uh, you know, it definitely has a lot of, there's even a scene that, you know, directly references Edgar Wright's quick editing from, uh, his films. Uh, so clearly the film knows what it's trying to do and who it's kind of trying to, uh, at worst rip off at best pay homage to. Um, that said, you know, one of the things that kind of holds this one back, it, okay, on the one hand, it's it's so much fun to see a musical with zombies in it and to see characters singing and dancing while they're killing zombies. All of that's good, but there wasn't as much frenetic action and violence to this as I think a lot of people who would be in the mood to see a movie like this were hoping for. Uh, th this isn't Overlord, right? This isn't uh, a film where the gore is not, is sort of like taken a little bit more seriously, where it's, uh, you know, you get the thrills from the violence and everything like that. It, it more or less just sort of plays it straight, which uh, it, it, it kind of held this one back. It, it didn't have as much substance as I was kind of hoping for. But none of the character motivations, as you can expect, were all that deep or meaningful. There, there are a couple of moments where you do feel the deaths and you, you do kind of like, oh, I actually kind of like, I was starting to like that character and you did this. Uh, th those moments do happen. And I think that a lot of people are going to get get some real fun out of this. I think that it's a great theater movie. I think people, people in the audience were having a kick. Uh, this is one of those that, uh, you know, if you really love the soundtrack too, if you can watch it ahead of time and see it with some friends, it, it really is a good time. It's one of those fun, schlocky horror Christmas movies. Just not all that much to it, unfortunately. I don't, I don't think most people are going to like it or get all that much out of it. But there are true moments of fun here. I think that uh, the headmaster in particular uh, is, is just a, a truly insane bonkers character. He's played by Paul K actually. Uh, he's like a tyrannical headmaster. Uh, he, he gets, he gets to choose some scenery here as well. Uh, some, uh, most of the characters are pretty miss, but there are some, uh, interesting things here. Anna Shepard's played by, uh, Ella Hunt, who, uh, I know I've, I've seen her in, in something before, but, uh, I, I honestly can't remember what it was. It was probably, uh, a European film from here and there, some, some TV show I've seen, but uh, no, she's, she's a terrific actress. She's not Jessica Roth good in the sense that you're like, Oh my goodness, she needs more movies. 
But uh, she definitely is somebody to to keep your eye on. She has a lot of charisma and very young actress. And she doesn't look it. She looks like she's in her like mid twenties. She's actually only twenty years old. Um, but that said, she has a great no, presence. Clear down. Oh, I'm not trying to put her down at all. I think she looks very mature for her age, and like that was actually okay. something I was not going on uh, Riverdale kid for the same I, thing. That's exactly what I was going to reference. Uh, you kind of uh, yes, uh, KJ Hobie or whatever his name is. Uh, you think that he looks very old. He's actually like I'm a lot closer to the age of his character than some people would assume. He just has a natural look of somebody a little yeah. bit older. So to be fair, I didn't say very old. I think he just looks like my age, but he's like five <laughs> years younger. <laughs> regardless, regardless. Um, yeah, Anna and the Apocalypse, it's up your alley, Will. I think that, uh, I, I don't think you'll, I don't expect you'll love it or adore it or anything like that, mm-hmm. but uh, I do think uh, I could definitely see you uh, enjoying this one for what it is and then having a good time with it. So uh, I hope you're cool. able to check it out soon. I give it a, uh, I was between like a B minus and a C plus. Mm-hmm. I'm more C plus at the moment. I want to see it again. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'll like it better the next time. If the music was a little bit better, I'd probably give it the B minus, but some of the songs were not very good. And uh, I think the ending kind of is uh, uh, not as great as it could have been, but um, it, it's a, it's an enthusiastic C plus. I want to say it's, it's not a, like this movie's terrible kind of C plus. It really is sort of like, okay, there are a lot of problems with this, but you just love it's It's one of those bad movies you can't help, but kind of love. Uh, but uh, I hope you, you actually like it as a good movie. And uh, I hope that uh, I know some people really like this one and, and others mm-hmm. are a bit more on my side. So it, it's another one that's kind of split where some people take it seriously and others don't. But uh, I think people should go see this one and uh, decide for themselves. I think you'll know from reading the synopsis, whether or not you have any interest yeah. whatsoever. Uh, did you see the short film that's based on zombie musical? No. Um, that's it's, why I was uh, kind of guessing that yeah. it doesn't have the Christmas tint. Yeah, I, I think the guy who made um, that is the Ryan Gosling only a serial guy. Mm. He okay. uh, unfortunately passed away a couple years ago, but yeah, I believe that's who made that short film. And, so. uh, and now I'm putting down this his legacy is what you're saying. So mm, I don't think so. <laughs> I just I mean that was a short film. We're not talking about the movie. Yeah, I'm jesting, of course, yeah. of course. Um, but okay, that's Anna and the Apocalypse. Uh, Next week, we are going to be talking about Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Uh, Will, you've already seen it, but we're going to yep. hold off on your thoughts. I already talked a little bit about it last week, but that'll yep. definitely be our featured review. Uh, hopefully, we'll also get around to talking about Mortal Engines. Uh, that's yep. the new wide release from Universal, which, my goodness, there's a lot of wide releases because not only is Mortal Engines, that's the uh, the book adaptation uh, produced by Peter Jackson of Lord of the Rings. Uh, we also have The Mule, the new Clint Eastwood film that's going to be trying to get sort of like the drama older audiences uh that's the the mule i think we talked about that a little bit last week bradley cooper is in that along with clint eastwood florence fishburne michael pena andy garcia a really great cast and uh if beale street bale street could talk um if bale street could talk i want to say it right at least once uh that's going to be hitting limited release along with the latest lars von trier movie the house that jack built and uh, i forgot to mention bale street of course is the latest from barry jenkins so we have some we have an awards favorite one that's probably going to be nominated for best picture hopefully we're going to be able to talk about bale street either next week or the week after depending on when we're able to get our hands on some screenings yeah is the, the deadpool thing coming out this week too it is. I, I decided not to go to my screening. Um, okay. I'm, I'm kind of done with Deadpool at the moment. I, I might check it out, though. Um, and if our listeners really want us to talk about it, then write yeah. us in. Let us know that uh, you demand Deadpool, and we'll, we'll talk about it. Okay. Um, are you going to be seeing it? I have a screening on Tuesday. I wasn't sure if I was going to go. It's for my Mortal Engines screening, so I might I might just check it out. It's what it is. I, it's just Deadpool 2, right? But it's PG-13. Right. And Fred Savage is in it. Right. They added okay. some things to it. That's why I'm just like, eh, well, I saw Deadpool 2. So, yeah. All right. Oh, um, yeah. What a trick. Make, it, make us watch the same movie again, but PG-13. Interesting. Well, yeah. Well, if you go to your screen, you don't have to pay for it. That's true. So yeah. that's how you get Now it. you're thinking with your brain, Milash. <laughs> All right, well, that is uh, all we have for you this week on Cinemaholics. Once again, find more episodes of our show on adamtickets.com. Thank you, as always, for listening. You can uh, email us anytime, cinemaholicspodcast.gmail.com. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, and we're on whatever podcast you choose. So if you want us to leave us a review or like us or comment or just interact with us in any sort of way, go to our show notes, find all the links you can get uh, down there, and uh, we'll hope to see you again next time. From the Internet California, I am John Agroni. And for the internet, Pennsylvania, I'm Washington. For Maverick Hines from the Broadband Basement, we will see you next time. Cheers. Cheers.